this year than we did last year, and I think some of that has to do with uh, the capital projects. We were kind of on hold with the budget, school budget not passing uh, by the voters, so we were kind of waiting on that. Uh, I think that same thing happened with the library. So instead of paying her two, uh, the library two quarters, we only paid one. Yes. There are things of that nature. Uh, quite a few of the other de expenditures. It's, it's interesting to me because the administration budget was up uh, 20 or so thousand. Finance was down 20 or so thousand. That has to do with our purchasing agent uh, staffing moving into Larissa's budget. Um, planning budget went down, but the IT budget went up, and by similar amounts again, and um, those were totally unrelated. <laughs> Speaking of Halloween. <laughs> um, and uh, so the IT department, they, you know, they've been doing a lot of new things. They've got the C-click fix. Yeah. There was another one, is it town meeting or some town something? I forget what it's called. So is that C-click, you, you say it's time, did that get accelerated? Um, no, it's just that it's new, it's sort of new, so we have licensing fees now that we didn't have before. And a couple of articles I've been reading yeah. that were saying that uh, sales were down with the uh, vehicles. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of forecasting out of consumer outlook, if you will. Uh, but it's starting to soften a little bit, but we're not seeing it. But so far, not so on wood, we're not so seeing good. that. Okay. Um, I mean, that's a cautionary note, though. That we've continued to raise that bar yeah. and, and been able to meet it every year and frankly exceed it. So that's going to run out, and I think we're probably getting close to that. Oh, that's the right thought. Yeah. Okay. The only item that I kind of think is a slight concern is, and I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, it's not that big of a deal, it's only about a $1,200 increase, but it's a, it turns into a 20% increase in expenditures for general assistance. So I don't know what that kind of bodes, but it's just another item. Why we don't spend a lot on general assistance, but 
it's just something that we should be aware of. Yeah, and I don't know if it's the No, there's one particular incident. There was a fire, and, and the, the, oh, so the, the okay. tenants were, or the occupants weren't able to occupy, so we helped them out in the near term. I think they found long-term solutions now, but um, there was some housing assistance for, for that incident. So it was sort of an incident, not... Yeah, uh, incident-driven okay. entirely. Yeah, good. Yeah. Good. I think that pretty much uh, covers that. We've, we hadn't received our tree growth money, but we just received that last week, too, so fr from last year, so from the state. So we did receive that. So I think we're we're doing okay so far. Okay. I got some questions, but I know we're trying to be brief. And thorough. So, and thorough. And thorough. And thorough. So I will, I will limit um, my 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 kind of detailed questions to just kind of bigger picture stuff. Um, community services. Are, are we gonna? I know there's been, or at least I've had some interest in the past four or five years trying to break out the deliverables between what we're providing to the school and what's coming back because not necessarily to take an accounting so that you know we can say one's doing better than the other but just to kind of see where the breakdown is i know that's always been some, in the past it's been challenging sure. because it's it's you know some credits here you know exchanges of service goods and services that aren't always recorded in so is there any plan with todd in not a in yeah in fact we have a meeting uh, this wednesday uh, the todd jepson and Julie and uh, Susan and I to, to do that specifically with community services and that relationship. Okay. We have actually done something townwide, and we've, uh, I can't say that we've attributed a value or a cost to every one of those reciprocal services. Um, we could certainly provide that to you just to get a, a sense of the amount of cooperation that exists. Uh, but your point's well taken. Putting a, um, having confidence with the dollar amount of that exchange uh, is, has been a challenge in the past. But sir, I mean, do you think that's something when we start developing next year's budget, we'll at least have a better general understanding of maybe where that delineation is, so that we can again, like I said, not because I want to charge one group or not charge another, but just to kind of see where, you know, if there are opportunities for cost savings in areas, we could kind of know where we're at first before we. Can. Sure, and and uh, this most recent conversation is really prompted by Julie, uh, openly questioning whether it's uh, you know who's getting the better side of the the deal. What mm -hmm. I can say definitively is the taxpayer is the one that's benefiting sure. because that cooperation certainly helps the bottom line. Uh, how exact we can get or should get in terms of which side of the ledger, whether school or town it's shown on, that's a, a, a work in progress. But she's very interested in understanding what we do for each other, and I think that exercise will, will naturally extend to trying to put a finer point of dollar amount to it. Yeah, we had that conversation a couple years ago, too, Yeah, in fact, uh, that was for that per pupil analysis. That was a fair criticism, if you will. There were some costs not actually reflected in those numbers, and presumably there's, it's like that in other districts as well. But for us, we tried as best we could to equalize those numbers, and we ran them. Uh, we charged uh, market rent for the, them using the space upstairs, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then we actually attributed a cost for community services as well, and we ran those numbers. The numbers changed, but our ranking didn't change, as I recall. We could share that back out with you if you like. Yeah, I think to your point, though, it's more along the lines just informing the, the public that, yeah, I mean, instead of squabbling over who's paying for what, at the end of the day, it's it's a shared service. And if we're sharing services, we've got to highlight that and mm -hmm. show where the costs, benefits are, and who's where those are showing up in the economy, basically. So, sure. um, another question I had is, in your notes, Ruth, you mentioned um, an insurance incident. And I noticed in the reimbursement section there was another, it was 53687 Was there a specific incident or was there something that, that... I think there were a couple of incidents that happened um, where involving, I think it was a police vehicle and another, it might have been a couple of police vehicles, but in both instances we were hit by whoever. Yeah, we were and, 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 uh, That's right. Yeah, and so... I think it was the same woman. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, she so didn't have a good day. So I think uh, we pay, we do in-house repairs to the extent that we can, and then you know the insurance money will come in after. But insurance goes into a revenue account, and the expenditure shows. So it's yeah, I was just wondering if there was, you know, because that's it's not a lot of money. It's, it's 
fairly insignificant in the course. I didn't know if there was something that was happening. But so insurance will allow us to do the repair and they'll reimburse us for that repair ourselves? We have a deductible, and if we can get that back from the insurance company, we do. Otherwise, we can, the Public Works Department puts in, you know, their estimates. They submit that to the insurance. So very often we perform the work and we're reimbursed? So, yeah, so the insurance company allows for that. Yeah, so what you'll see, and we can show it maybe in the next cycle, is that there'll be an offsetting reimbursement as a revenue. I saw that. That's where the 5387 came from. It was in a note. Right. There's the increase. Right. Oh, we had a run of, I think, three different vehicle accidents. The accident that was the last of the three, and they're all major and significant. In each case, our insurance company segregated, you know, chased the other company and will be made whole. Okay. And then, I guess maybe the last one I had. Oh, actually, this was more, this was just me not realizing what I'm looking at here, but there was, on the revenue, on the fund balance sheet, on the fund balance side, and I'm sure I'm just looking at this the wrong way, here's a variance of what's been done here. If there's positives and minuses within the two of them, so like if we were to compare, let me rephrase that. Assets usually show as a positive. The liabilities and fund balance usually show as credits, and for us, credits put the negative in front of them. I knew there was, and I've had that explanation before. I just looked at it from the website. Yeah. Yeah. Drawing a little slip on that. And then, just the last final one here, looking on page three for the comparative year-to-date revenues. The top line on the taxes, I know that includes property, excise, and everything else. That's like a .004% difference in revenue. How does, I mean, I know, I mean, I don't want to show from the rooftops, but I know taxes went up more than that last year. How is that not reflected in that number? Well, that's a good question. I'm not sure what I can answer to that, but I think it has to do, it probably has to do with the excise. Okay. That might have, you know, because we were always, the excise is just so good. Yeah, yeah. That's the only thing I can think of. Because we're expecting $1.1 million more in revenue. Yeah, right. Well, and I'm just looking at the revised estimate. And like I said, maybe it was just I missed something in the process, but I would have expected the taxes revenue to have gone up a little bit more than that. But, again, it's not, I know that it's a pot, it's a collection of all kinds of other things that are in there. So I may just be looking at it the wrong way. Well, we had more collected in last September than we do now in real estate taxes. Excise taxes, we were at $1.4 million, $1.44 this year. Last September of 16, we were at $1.426. So I think those are the two differences. Okay. Okay, that's it. That's the summary. So I think the next topic, which may or may not be thoroughly short, was supposed to talk about the recommended debt policy. And I think the last time we had spoken, you know, you had taken it, collapsed it into a document that we can now review, which is great. We'll start that conversation. I know Boris and I have had some conversations. There are some markers in there around debt that we'll want to talk about. Before we get to that, circling back to the minutes that we didn't review, I just wanted to mention we had left off, I think Boris and I talked to you just about updating on the metrics that we had talked about at the meeting. And I think this kind of update, I think you and I had talked about just updating us where you were. I think we were, there were still some, you know, we were doing some tweaking to like. Yeah, so I think that what I heard at the last meeting, and I hope that we heard the same thing, was that we thought we had a fairly finalized set of metrics that we were going to be keeping tabs on. I heard you say that you wanted me to source where I got the ranges from. 
and that we also, um, there were some that did not have ranges listed. And there still are some that don't have ranges listed because those are purely policy decisions. There's not an industry standard for some of those ranges, and so that's going to need to be a decision from the Finance Committee and ultimately, of course, the Town Council, what you want those ranges to be and, and where the red flags are going to, to be placed within those ranges. So um, there was also a little bit of discussion. I had shown the increase in participants in the property tax assistance program as being a caution. Um, got a little bit of feedback from not just this committee, but also from Councillor Donovan that, no, that should be a green, that's a good thing. And I would argue that absolutely, we, it's good that the people that need assistance are coming forward and asking for it. I'm going to continue to encourage us to see, however, increases in that if they are to be year over year as a cautionary note towards ability to pay in the community. That if more and more people within the community are eligible for the program, it means that our demographics are shifting and that we need to be aware of that when we're talking about ability to pay. So, um, and I had included that in the list of metrics as an ability to pay measure. So that's where. So the only thing that would caution on that though is we're, we're also looking at expanding the parameters of that. So it may skew Absolutely. in terms of the ability of people to pay. If we had the same bench, uh, benchmark and the same metric year in, year out, I think that's a great idea to, to say, okay, who's, where's that, how are people meeting up or down that threshold? Well, if we keep moving the threshold up as well, that's kind of sometimes a good So I'm going to throw a last trick in there and say, yep. we're, we're going to be adjusting those parameters too, I think, over the course of the next I would assume maybe the next cycle or two, anyway, whether it's increasing the total amount of deduction or in increasing the income level or something. I think that's on the plate for next year as well. To yeah, and to make sure that those indicators don't fall off the table and aren't used going forward, I mean, it, 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 that's a possibility. We tried, and as I read this, it's kind of buried in here, but in the introduction of page one, we do make reference to, it says this policy also establishes fiscal and financial health uh, indicators, this is kind of the last sentence of that first paragraph in red, uh, that will guide budgeting and planning decisions of both staff for both staff and elected officials uh, by adopting these indicators and committing to using them to guide decision making, blah, 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 blah. Um, so uh, that's our intent, attempt to really kind of codify and make sure that that, that kind of flows throughout. Uh, those indicators touch one or more of the sections of this policy. So um, were we intended to in include that dashboard as maybe an exhibit? Um, we certainly can. I think we have talked, though, about how the dashboard is really supposed to be seen as a, um, as a kind of a moving sort of dashboard, right? It's an annual update and that it would be online. So I think it can certainly if most people access our policies from the website, so again, we can benefit from being able to say, if, you know, if we want to link the dashboard to the document within the website, we absolutely can do that um, without necessarily needing to find a place to bury in the text the dashboard itself. Yeah, and the second paragraph goes on to say that, that staff will uh, produce that dashboard annually within a month of the CAFR being completed. So again, it's just kind of a bright line that this isn't falling away. This is something we're going to continue to do year over year. But it needs to be based on the CAFR, that language is in there. I felt like a month was enough time for staff to be able to um, use the audit to, to run, the metrics are not challenging to run, and it would be enough time to update the, the Excel spreadsheets that they are the, the background behind the, the dashboard um, and to get that done. And that means usually the CAFR is ready by the end of December, so by the end of January, um, we should be able to have that conversation with the Finance Committee. Sean, I think you did. I think that was one of your comments back about the metrics and kind of revisiting. Are you, are you comfortable where we are? Absolutely. So I think the minutes can just reflect, I think, are we all comfortable saying this is just a starting point for us? Yeah, definitely so. I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to go back and look at the minutes too, though, is because I know we were having some pretty detailed conversation about what we're going to use for for debt management, yeah. for capita, or, um, and I, I wasn't, and again, I could, it could be just me. I wasn't confident that we had nailed those down, but if you guys are in agreement that this is what we use, I'm, I'm fine with that. You can, a good starting point. You can just look at it. Well, can we use maybe this as an opportunity to segue into discussing of, so I also heard from you at the last meeting that you wanted me to come forward with suggestions of what policy statements might look like. Um, that policy statements, of course, need to come from you, not from staff, um, but these are examples of what policy statements could look like. Um, numbers, of course, subject to your desires and language as well. And it's all those later on in the document. But also in the uh, 
front page, the executive summary, the bottom, the bottom portion focuses those five are on kind of there's, there's, um They are, the four of them, debt service, uh, numbers one, three, four, and five are embedded in the first section of the combined policy debt management, and number two is embedded in the fund balance section. Or just before we yeah. say, I think only I brought those metrics back up to just make sure we are comfortable that that was going to be our starting point. And then it's reflected the next mm -hmm. finance committee, which will convene in a short period of time from now. Mm -hmm. Then can take that and modify and adjust it, whatever. But yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Just a okay. final point, maybe to comfort you, Chris. Uh, the final two sentences in that new section inter uh, introduction says none of the indicators found in this policy alone or in combination should be used to make decisions on fiscal policy. Rather, they're intended to be early warnings of areas that need further discussion. Policy statements should be developed. Yeah, yeah. So I, we're just I'm trying to that, yeah. couch them as to what they are and how they'll be used. So that's great. So we can have a mixture of like that. Then. That is a perfect segue to it. I think the heart of our conversation will be around some of the your recommendations mm -hmm. for the debt. If, you, if you've got time, and we, we've got time. to meet your we criteria do. of thorough and quick. Um, some of the rationale, some of your thoughts of, of sure. why you kind of selected these and what you're thinking about and why you think they're, you know, a good start to a policy would be great. Sure. So um, most of them actually are already in your current debt management policy. I did remove one, and I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me, but maybe somebody could tell me which one is struck through. Um, and I have amended the one of them to be about revenue as opposed to expenditure. Okay. So if you go to Appendix A or Appendix 1, in just immediately following the um, debt management section, I'm trying to find your page number. 15. Thank you. I'm sorry, 15. Yep, 1, 5. So that's where currently the, um, the things that we, uh, in the original policy, we say we're going to measure these and we're going to keep track of them. So the, I have not eliminated debt per capita, I've just shifted it down. Um, and so the first one has been amended to be annual debt as a percentage of government budgeting, budgeted operating revenues. And that was a recommendation by Joe Katara to shift that from expenditures to revenues. That's why that, that decision was made. Um, and the, the numbers that you see in there right now, um, exceeding 15% is a bond industry standard warning sign. They don't like it when municipalities exceed 15%. That is justification for um, being concerned about the, the rating that they currently hold. Are you and talking debt per capita? Nope, I'm on debt service as a percentage of annual revenues. You, you oh, yeah, sorry. So 16, so 16 is where it carries over. Yeah, sorry. Yep, and it's also the number one on your, your summary. Yep. Can you just a quick question? So, Jim, who? Joe yeah. Kutara is our oh, bond okay. counsel. Okay, so why, why, was the, why did he, what was his rationale? from switching from expenditures to revenue? Because he sees that the bond rating agencies are shifting from expenditures oh. to revenues as the point of assessment. And, and so that's an industry. Right. Yeah. Okay. That was, so that was his recommendation. Okay. Um, and that we really would like to keep that percentage below 12%. That would be, if you want to call it your yellow flag, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're not in danger territory yet, but if we, if we break that 12%, it's an area for some policy discussion to take place. Um, and on the dashboard, you would have seen um, a green 8, a yellow 12, and a red 15. So that was where that kind of that line came from. Yep. If we go to the next one, which... I'm sorry, can I ask? Yes, of course. Down. So if it is between 8 and 12, that will be green? Yes. 12 to 15 will be yellow, and 15 and above would be red. That, that would be how I would there? interpret that, yes. All right. And clearly, the closer you get to the 15, that darker that you become far more orange. Yeah. So, um, my favorite color, but in this situation, perhaps not the best to be in. Um, so if we want to jump to, on your summary, to number three, which is actually then number two on the policy, um, you have total debt as a percentage of state equalized valuation. And this is another um, bond rating standard. Um, we currently have this at 2.5. Previously, it was at 2.53. As our debt load has come down and our valuation has gone up, that number becomes more favorable. Um, the 8.5% number is actually from the, bond, the debt management policy. We have set our own standard on that. Um, the state actually would allow that number to go to 15%, but we have established a much more rigorous standard. 
Um, and I have simply suggested that because we are so well below 3%, that it really should maybe be a goal to not exceed 3%. That, that is one of the, the lines that we could kind of set for ourselves as a goal, not as a red flag necessarily, but that 3% and under would be considered green, and if we cross that 3% line, we're at least into yellow at that point, without, and that um, we are not in a seriously dangerous place until we've hit, we're not allowed by policy to go past 8.5, so if we get to 7.5, I think red should be coming out at that point. Did you take a look at the calculation to see what would happen if the bond for the public safety building passes? That's a great question. I have not. Um, I don't believe that it would cause us to break the 3% based on what's coming off and what we expect our valuation to increase by. I will happily run that for you for next time. Though. And I think that if you could actually um, stress test it even further to include it um, or compare it to the long-range facilities projections, understanding understanding that uh, there has been no priority placed in any particular project other than the, the public safety building, but, you know, kind of like long-term, where are we going to be in comparison to that spreadsheet you gave us before? I absolutely can. I will just, uh, as a caveat, would like to say, though, that CIP will be a large factor in that and yeah. how much bonding of the policy, how we can move on for that. So again, we can kind of break that down with an estimate of two, three, five, or six. Yeah. Um, so that can definitely happen. And, and the assumptions for future uh, growth in our valuation will have to be made too, yeah. so depending what you I, I, I'd you almost say. like to see. I'd almost like to see a separate meeting, to be honest with you, or, around those three key indicators. Because as we increase or as it, in, as it shifts, let's say, as a percentage of State equalized value. I'd like to see what that does to it as per capita millions because we need to be setting parameters here that conflict with each other. You know, I mean, if, we, if it's 15% on one, that may, you know, not even trigger anything in another capacity. You see what I'm saying? I do. So I think that that's yeah, yeah. one of the reasons that, um, as Tom pointed out earlier, the 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 language in the second paragraph of the introduction about how they are used to guide policy decisions. Um, I think it is reasonable to expect that if one rises, we would expect to see a rise in the other, yes. not to the point perhaps where we've crossed the threshold for ourselves, um, but that is part of the purpose of just generating the discussion. Right. Um, so I can, I, I don't believe that I'll be able to actually create for you um, any sort of ratio that we can say when debt per capita increases by 2%, we would expect that to equal a 3% increase in debt but because they're not yep. equal. Our value may well continue to rise even if our population were to stagnate. Right, so right. we could end up with a, a, a bigger yeah. and bigger difference. I, I guess, I, and this is just my personal perspective, and if, if, you, if you guys don't agree, then that's fine. I, I, I'd like to get a little bit more meat behind it and get a better understanding of it because I, I'm not necessarily concerned about setting a policy of it. I'm also concerned about the perception behind it. Yeah. Or if we put a number in there, and if it's, ar not, I don't want to say arbitrary, but if we know that you know we're, in, we're most likely, unless something catastrophic happens, we're probably going to hit 8.5 percent of our percentage of state equalized valuation. It's very challenging. Right. So um, I, you know, if we know that, then at least have something in there as a caveat to say, or, or we adjust our ranges more appropriately to, to kind of find that in a little bit or something. So we're not. So when someone comes and looks at that and they just pull that segment out, they go, well, oh, you guys are doing great because you're. 3% out of 8.5, but then you go down to per capita, and you so, suddenly now you're 8% of 8.5 or something. They go, well, what's, you know, which one are we looking at? How are we pulling it out? So I just, I just like to have a little bit more of an understanding of how the interaction yeah. play off each other before we set the, the, fine, the finite yeah. numbers. But I like the ranges. I, uh, sure. I, just, I think before we put it in hard copy, I'd like to yeah. explore it a little bit deeper. So I think we can pull out, um, and I can have resent to you. I think that the um, worksheet that we gave you either at the last meeting or the one prior where we've calculated all of these for where we are currently, yep. as well as I believe maybe where we were the year prior, I yep. think that that will give you where those relationships are right now at least as kind of a point in time. And just as a quick um, estimate, 3% of our current valuation would be $114 million in debt held. Um, as of November 1, after we have done our payment, we will be at 91 or 84. Mm -hmm. 84. So that is um, $30 million below where that 3% of full state valuation would be. And the proposed public safety building, of course, is not anywhere near that. Mm -hmm. Right. Well. Right. It doesn't come close. So from so we would be able to well be well below that 3% that threshold with that one. Um, but no, I can happily run those for you. Um, yeah, and, I, and, I, and again, I think that I just like to have a discussion as a group of more people. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah.
So, and I think that that sheet that we gave you a couple times ago, if not last time, really is, a, is, is, that, is that conversation, and maybe that can be the, the kind of focus of the conversation moving forward. Um, which, which, uh, yes. The one that, yep, the one that we gave either last meeting or the one prior in which we showed you what um, the policy currently called for for limits and showed you where we were yeah. and the difference in, in value between the two. Okay. Um, so I, I really like looking at our debt as a percentage of state equalized value. Um, it gives us a really great, if, if we insist on doing an outward looking peer comparison, it does allow us to um, apple to apple a little bit more easily. Mm -hmm. um, and it also is where we have structured our debt policy to be so much more rigorous than the state. Um, and where we are so far below even our own more rigorous standards, I think it should give people at least, I hope, a sense that um, this is being kept in, in check within both our own policies and state guidelines. So then the biggest point of, I think, discussion will surround the uh, number four, which is debt per capita. So I was thinking, I was looking at some examples um, of other communities and how they create ranges within their policy statements for debt per capita. And what I found is that a popular one is one that I've given you as a separate metric, which is per capita debt as a percentage of per capita income, so that's number five. So that really was a challenge to think about, okay, we can't say we're going to use a fifth metric to express our fourth metric. That seems a little bit inappropriate. So try to think about how do we want to consider debt per capita. So you'll see in your summary that I've said, well, every five years, we will use ratio five, that per capita debt as a percentage of per capita income as an assessment. Why every five years? Because that's when we have census data. So we have the decennial census every 10 years, and then American Community Survey gives us fairly decent, although not nearly as great as our decennial census data on the fifth year. As soon as 2020 happens and the census data comes through from that, we will actually move up to every three years with the American Community Service because we will have um, crossed over 20,000 at that point. And so this policy language could change to every three years doing a reassessment um, of that, that per capita debt as percentage of per capita income. If you'll see, though, I do say on an annual basis, debt per capita will be reported as part of the annual review of fiscal health indicators. So we can at least report the number out. I am not able to find any industry standards of what debt per capita should or should not look like. What, so that led to needing to decide, okay, do we wish to have an external facing debt per capita um, assessment or an internal facing? And so, uh, so right now, so three months ago, we have the highest per capita debt of our neighboring communities. Comparison. And then Falmouth took out some money. And now Falmouth has the highest per capita debt. So I'm concerned about comparing our per capita debt levels to our neighboring communities because if everybody suddenly decides to, to invest in their infrastructure and maintenance costs, then we end up looking better than we did the month before they did so. So it's a false assessment of our own health I mean, just because everyone around you has diabetes doesn't mean that you're healthy. It just means that you might not be as unhealthy as, as, as that person living next to you. So I wanted to think about how could we assess per capita debt uh, internally and inward focusing, to, and that would be, again, policy levels about where you guys felt comfortable where that should be, but how could we create a, a system that would allow us to assess ourselves against ourselves only, regardless of how our peer group was deciding to behave with their money. Um, and that's just a suggestion. You may well say, actually, let's do both. Let's look out and let's look in. Um, so I suggested in that final sentence there, new debt issuance will be discouraged if the new debt will result in debt per capita exceeding 125% adjusted for inflation of base year fiscal year 18. And so what does that say to people? That says, okay, this is where we are with debt right now. And moving forward, we are making a um, commitment to the population that we are not going to allow that debt per capita load to exceed by X percent over where we currently are. And that's just a question for you guys to decide if you like that approach, like saying, let's put a cap on it based on a base year. And the base year is up for discussion. The, um, maybe it's not, maybe 125% is uncomfortable and 110% feels better. I would caution that there may well be something that comes up where there's simply new debt is voted in by the people 
and you are going to break policy if you've set that bar too low. But uh, alternately, you may have people that feel that you've given yourself too much freedom and flexibility if you set the bar too high. So this is just a suggestion of how that, that could look. Um, if you wanted something similar from an external facing, which makes me uncomfortable, but I'm just here to give you suggestions, you could say something along the lines of um, new debt issued will be um, discouraged if it will result in Scarborough's debt per capita exceeding the median debt per capita of the established comparison communities by X percent. And so there's, there's ways that we can phrase language that would allow it to be external facing versus inward facing or to allow it to be both. Um, but debt per capita is challenging because population, like I said, we can only really truly get population numbers every 10 years, every five years, a fairly good estimate. Um, and it, it just is it's a weaker metric, but it's apparently important to people. So how do we report it out and give some sort of policy up? So did you say are, are different municipalities using this approach, or is this sort of a, a new twist? Of so I did not find any municipalities that are using the, the sentences that I've just given you as far as internal <laughs> and external. What they're using is metric five. Yeah. And, but what I heard very clearly last time is that this committee does not have interest in dropping debt per capita and you want some way to assess it. And so we are going to have to think outside the box and create our own way to assess that and decide for ourselves how do we wish to assess. The industry is not giving us standards and I'm not finding language from other communities that is giving us um, a, a, a role model to follow. So we get to be the role model. Mm -hmm. And we get to, to say, okay, well, what does it mean to self-assess debt per capita? And what I think gave rise to all this conversation is that some might say we're already there or have exceeded it, but others, we sense the discomfort that we're reaching a point of our, our kind of overall debt load of discomfort. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I agree, but I think it's, it's very subjective, right? Because, I mean, the perception is, I mean, if we're carrying, you know, millions of dollars worth of debt, you know, someone with a reference point might say that's really high. But comparing it to what? Comparing it to what we're able to pay, or comparing it to what, you know, how much the debt uh, the, the payment is, you know, for the, the debt service. I mean, that's really, I think, what we what we need to look at measuring. And I mean, I think, um, I mean, I, I, maybe the first step is we decide if we want to look internal or external, because I think that will really, I, I could see kind of combining four and five into something depending on what we want that outlook to be. Um, I, I, would, I would tend to defer to staff and say I, I'd rather have it be a little bit more internal, structured internally some way, but if it needs to be external, maybe we run an average, you know, or we pick whatever the state average, I don't know, something, but it's going to, it's a really tough evaluation though because it's, I mean, part of the things is we, we tend not to, def we, we, you know, do you defer maintenance and your infrastructure payments on your operating budget and then take the big hit if every five or ten years for a building, or do you constantly put that in your operating budget, put money aside to save for that big cash? So it kind of comes to that philosophy of how we're going to manage that, you know. And I would be cautious about using a state average. I think that um, we would want to, and I think we can do so um, very, I think we can do so Scientifically, is perhaps too strong of a word, but I think we can do so with, with being very careful and very justifying in the communities that we choose. Um, and they might not all be Maine communities. We may wish to look at communities that are outside of Maine, maybe still within New England, but that have a similar commercial to residential base mix, that have a similar population size, that have a similar demographic split. I think that there are ways, to, if you wish to be external facing and we want to use some sort of median of that cohort, I think that there are ways to craft that, um, that group so that it's large enough to be significant and, and reasonable, um, but with the parameters narrow enough so that, it, that nobody can accuse us of simply pulling communities that we want to out. So I think that that's another discussion for another day. Yes. But we can do either way, but I think if we are going to be external, I would really encourage us to be very clear about why the communities we're comparing ourselves to are in that list. And I can foresee us actually writing a, writing the policy around that by saying not necessarily naming the community, but by saying a community with similar metrics that we have or similar. And that's really important because think about it. Right. If you have 21 or 22 percent of your tax base is commercial industrial, 
that per capita number doesn't mean that everyone owns that debt is paying that debt. Right. You've got 20 plus percent being paid for by people aren't counted, you know, by someone not counted in that metric. This goes into as far as the external. I always said that, and I would prefer. I don't like comparing Scarborough to X community. I don't mind comparing us to the average, or um, you know, the average of our peer group, because then you know it's average. You can pick it. You know, you know what I mean. It, it shapes the conversation very differently than trying to compare us to Falmouth or Cape Elizabeth, because the communities are very different, very very different. I did want to ask though is um, on this here. It seems to me that the debt per capita would be useful if you compared it against debt per capita um, that is voter approved versus the total amount. Oh, interesting. So CIP borrowing being separated out from voter approved borrowing and right. seeing, well, that would be interesting. That's easy I, to do. I mean, I agree with the debt per capita from a whole basis because it is responsibility as a community. But then there's also the segmentation of the two approval groups. One is the council by itself that doesn't go to the voters, and then the other one is what is approved by voters. And they really should be in comparison to each other so that you know where that responsibility lies for the, for the approval or for the, the for where you are in that ratio. Obviously, you would have to make a policy statement that's different um, given the breakdown, or at least, you know, segregate the kind of, here's your overall policy based on all of it per capita. However, the sub to that is that we recognize that and that, you know, maybe the voter approval should not exceed X and Council's approval should not exceed Y. So can I, at the risk of not being brief or concise, <laughs> um, the all, one of the challenges I can see with that, and we're, I think hopefully to have a little bit of time to discuss this this evening, is I wonder how refundings complicate that equation. So when we refund debt, which we of course wish to do to save the taxpayers as much money as we can on, on debt service costs, we're lumping and aggregating together, and I think that the, the accounting to pull those numbers out would become extremely complicated. I like the idea, and I'm happy to spend some time with Ruth and, and to think mm -hmm. about what teasing that data out would look like and if it's even possible once we refund it and, and aggregate it. Do we refund voter approved debt? Because those sure. are big, big ones. Absolutely. Sure. In fact, that's the majority of it. I think we did the, the, was it the high school was the last one we did. And we did, okay. So that would be, I'm not suggesting get, that it's not Things possible. get co-mingled in a hurry once okay. you refund, do some advanced refunding. So that would be, it would be an interesting exercise, and we could certainly look at it from a prior to any refunding. This is what that, what that has looked like over time, but um, I think it would be challenging. Uh, it comes out of when you, when you do the calculation. What's the date that you do the calculation? Because refunding happens, what, May and It's whenever there's it's twice a, it's twice savings a year, to be had, we try to bring refundings to you and couple yeah. them with new new issuance as well. Yeah, so you think about it. Yeah, sure. that's about that is valuable, the value of a debt per capita. Well, again, I think, I, I mean, I, I still want to get back to the basic question of what do we want to, what do we, what do we want to gain by measuring this? I mean, we can do metrics, we can do metrics forever, measure for everything, little pendos, but I mean, I guess I'd like to, I was hoping, and I think we talked about doing this with the kind of a 50,000 foot yeah. basic indicator, you know, and I mean, I, I was going to say kind of in response to your question, I think there are a couple of things that I think we do need to do. I know we don't like to do the external view because unfortunately those that are local in the community, that's what they're looking at. So there's, there's an education process I think we need to go through. But I like your concept and what you suggested and if you could maybe work on that language around the median or the right benchmark communities to be able to, and again, the way we thought some of these things were going to work is that when we had our dashboard and stuff, you'd be able to dive into some of the explanation and stuff, but how you spit out some of those words um, might be a way that we can kind of have the best of both worlds, but we really, we can have a way we can look externally, but we are pretty careful about picking and choosing the right benchmarks to be looking at. Um, yeah, would you, yeah, no, would you have any, any Concerns about instead of like identifying a specific community, but but putting in some kind of language that says with similar metrics that we have a similar style of government, similar debt structure, similar you know what I mean, something that and so that we could we could literally have a little bit more flexibility because people are going to come up and into and out of that list, including us. Right? Yeah, so there's a short list of comparables. If you yeah. really want to get particular, there, there might be you can count on one hand in Maine. You yeah. really have to look elsewhere. I mean, I think I was trying to take all the conversations. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
it sounded like Tom was kind of suggesting it was because of the commercial mix or some yep. other things mm -hmm. comparing to some and more cable is that may not be the best example. But we're still saying to those that are interested in it, here is some rationale for we're looking internally and externally. And the list could I be like, yeah, I like the way you describe that as so and the list could be updated as part of the annual report in January, February. Like these are the communities that for this year match the, the perimeters that we've established. Um, and I would also encourage us to really make sure that there's never fewer than 10 or 50. Like you want a sample size that's large enough to actually give us a real median to work from um, instead of like five communities, it's really challenging to have a median with. Yeah, and I, and I think we should, I think that's useful. useful. From the policy perspective, we spell out what those perimeters are. But I, I mean, is there really anything to stop us from identifying uh, number four as within brackets internal and number five as in brackets external? And that way, that does frame the conversation of saying, you know, we're doing it both ways. How future council wants to weigh those is really up to them. Sure. So moved. Okay, yeah. so that will bring us, so we'll just move per capita debt as a percentage of per capita income to number six and add in four being debt per capita internal. Number five will become debt per capita external and I'll come back to you with some language, with some suggested language of how those could be, those could be plus. Yeah, perfect. Let's not lose sight of the fact, the bigger goal here in my mind, which is I hope to impress upon the community that we're paying attention, right. that we're going to track it over time. Right. Um, we're listening. We're, li we're listening. And and I guess the other piece that I continue to go back to, uh, our current structure and debt load is very comfortable and manageable for us. Right. That, from my perspective as manager, I, I can say that confidently. Others apparently may not have that same level of confidence, but we're not in any danger zone in that way. So I, I, I hope the bigger message gets out that we're paying attention and we're going to keep paying attention. And so the final one that I have provided for you is um, the, as we've mentioned before, the debt per capita, the percentage of per capita income. Um, and uh, this is a benchmark. This is a red flag industry standard. That 15% is a warning sign that we don't want to be crossing. Um, and I have just let you know that um, the per capita debt is a percentage of per capita income. Oh, the per capita income for 2015, according to the American Community Survey, was $40,139, which would limit debt per capita under that to be 15% of that is 6021 So we are significantly below that at this point. Um, and I, I understand that there's a number of people in the community that if we were to be like, hey, guys, we're at $6,000 per capita right now, they'd be distressed. Um, but I just wanted to kind of give us a, a signal to what that currently does look like because I think it's hard to, and if you don't have the solid numbers, what does that figure mean? Um, and the other thing about this metric that I really quite like is that, again, it's an ability to pay metric. So if something happens with our demographic that shifts so that our per capita income drops below that 40000 then that is going to, to signal um, okay, our, our debt service costs are going to become more burdensome to that population. On the flip side of that, if the demographic shifts in Scarborough so that our per capita income raises up to 50000 then that should be an equal signal to say, though there are still some struggling, as a community, we can handle maybe this additional debt load that we were worried about before. So, um, so when Amazon comes and average comes to well, they skyrocket. Well, that, no, that would be household income, not per capita, right? Because kids don't earn money. We still count them under per capita. So, <laughs> um, so I just, it's a, I think it's an, I would like to see it stay. Just, it's an industry standard. They like it. It's easy to calculate. And, but again, it's one that we cannot calculate annually. And everyone just needs to understand we're not obfuscating. We're not, but to, for us to calculate that annually would mean that we were, Creating a ratio with two imagined numbers, which is pointless. It's an academic exercise at that point. Any, any other comments on? I, 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 um, not on the ratios. I do have one request, or if you could look at this for us on page eight. I'm looking at it right. There's a section called Town of Scarborough Local Debt Limits, and it references Town Council Order Number 12-37 that was passed in 2012. So the structure of it does not need to be kind of changed uh, for presentation purposes. But I was wondering if you might be able to take a look at that and determine how were those limits originally set and if they're still applicable today. 
Okay, sure. Um, I can tell you how I think that they were set, but I'd have to go back and look at the minutes. But I they, wasn't on the council on that. Do we have an answer that I'm not aware of? So these are all set by state. So these categories are state statute set. So the state statute that's referenced above is, is where the language came from that you have chosen then to set your own limits. And the whoever was on council in, t in 2012, they set each of those levels significantly below where the state says that they'd be allowed to be. Hmm. And combined, to like you can spend it up to 8.5% of your valuation can be spent in debt. In debt. Um, no more than that, though, 5% can be for school. So you have permission to go to, by your own policy, 8.5% of the total assessed value could be held in debt. State tells you 15%. But you said, but of that 8.5%, the school can't have more than 5%. Sanitary district can't have more than 4%. Other purposes can't have but more than 4%. And airport water and special districts can't have more than 1.5%. So I think what happened was that when you look at the state statute language, most of those numbers are not quite double what you guys have set. They're about um, 30 or 40 percent higher. And I think you guys, whoever was on council in 2012, looked at the state numbers and said, we can do better, and they knocked them down by a percentage. But I'll look at the minutes. So, yeah, so is that 5 percent of the 8.5? 8.5 is equal to, num hypothetical numbers, is equal to $10,000. Then only, I'm going to screw this up in my head. So it's five percent of the ten thousand. No, it's five percent of your state valuation can be held in school debt. Oh, the state debt. Okay. But so you're right. no, you the can't total exceed cannot. the total. Well, so I'm trying to add these up in my head. And I'm like, well, that's working. more than eight and a half percent. So if you spend your five percent on school, of the okay. you can right. then you only have three and a half percent left to spend over to your other options. So sanitary, you're out of luck if we spend that three and a half percent on other purposes. In terms of where those, I think when we created the debt management policy back in 2012, I think we came up with those numbers, and that's what. Um, Maybe if we I'm not sure I can yeah. really remember how we came to those, but. Well, we'll just have to. I think once we make a, our, our adjustments, yeah. to, we'll have to go back and revisit that section and probably adjust that because I don't know if that's in line with what we're proposing before. Other than fixing how it looks in there, because if you're a dyslexic uh, kind of guy like me, I get all confused, but. Um, I wouldn't spend a lot of time on that after. Okay. Okay. That's the question for us before we get to. There's also the question on page nine, which we touched on a little bit. We still have in this policy, we talked about it last time, the equipment reserve fund. That really is the philosophy about whether, as you had suggested, if we take some of those things like fire engines and we, whether you just apply the depreciation to a reserve fund. But in ongoing budgets, you then have a line item that's expenditures for future things. And I guess it's still in here. I guess it's for us to decide whether it should be. But then my only question is, this gives some thought, as we were talking about those ratios, if we decide that the equipment reserve fund does need to be, should be part of our policy, does that have an impact on where you put those ranges and numbers? Because you'd be, I mean, fire engines and what are on so we did the depreciation exercise on last year's. Yep. Do you want to share what the funding amount would be to, to meet that requirement? Five million four. So we did. We and that's in the operational budget, right? Right. So I, so I think that everyone agrees that's that just equipment. It's a great thing to kind of pursue, understanding that your tax rate hit oh, yeah. in the years that you're trying to do that. Yeah. So we've been, I think that we want, we're not, we haven't fully flushed it out, so we're hoping to discuss it at a future meeting. We've been kind of playing with some different ways to approach how that fund could start to be um, supported and how that could be eased in over time. So that maybe there's some policy goals of how we fund that after X number of years with an understanding that it's going to need to be a slow yeah. ease to Versus not... As opposed to budgeting that money in the operating budget, which would take a huge hit on tax rate. And fund balance, potentially. One suggestion would be uh, looking at debt service year over year. If there's any savings from prior year, some percentage or all of that gets swept. Yeah, if you look at your debt service costs and look at this year, we know what our debt service costs were in 17. And if there's a, happens to be savings in fiscal year 18, take that savings and put it in. 18's budget is lower. Or some percentage of it, and you fund, you start to fund it. So it's not one for one. It's not full full depreciation value. 
but it starts to make headway. Well, there's, there's, I think this. Oh, sorry. Good, good. Okay. Well, I think there's a, there's a bunch of. I mean, to me, that's just another mechanism for sweeping money in. I mean, you could do something with excise where we cap it at five hundred thousand. Everything above five hundred thousand gets swept into a similar account five because million. that's a fluctuating account. <laughs> anyway. um, but yeah, five million, I think. But you know what I'm saying. I'm yeah, yeah. As a reference, but so I think you know. To me, at, there's also the philosophical challenge of. Who's paying for the, you're paying for a resource now that maybe a citizen's not going to get to use later on? Yeah. So who's paying for the usage of the of the resource? So so I think it's I think it's a good conversation, but I think that might be a whole separate meeting and philosophical push and discussion. Well, the, the only reason I bring it up in the context of this in the policy, policy mm -hmm. is there. Yeah. if it stays here, then I think the conversation we just had makes some sense about it. We think this mm -hmm. finance committee that it should be there, that we should move toward that, mm -hmm. then I think Tom's suggestion of, okay, do we put some language in about how we're going to start moving that way? If so, we should talk about that because then I think that may have an impact on, or may not, on uh, some of the numbers that you're running. So It won't have an impact on any of the... Well, that's true because it actually reduces yeah. debt in the longer term. Well, it does, and it also, I think, uh, it won't have any impact on the bond rating standards. I think that one of the things that we'll do is, is um, change our conversation a little bit. If we truly want to be comparing ourselves with other communities, if we're doing an outward external phase, right. how many people are using this sort of approach? Right. And therefore, if we haven't at all, are, like, do our numbers actually, to some people, should they look a little better? Because it's not like we're appropriating and bonding. Right. We're not paying both sides. So maybe, maybe that's why our tax rate, relatively speaking, is low. But anyway, so do we, as a count, as this group, is it worth pursuing staff to come back with some recommendations about? So I, I think we just have to decide what this, this stays in. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I I I hear what you're saying. I think for me, it's it's I don't want a second. I don't know the motivation behind the previous council that put it in. So I think I would have a hard time just completely removing it. Okay. Um, but but to make to put meat to it and to put levels to it and decide how we're going to fund it, I think we'd have to have a more a more detailed conversation around it. And so I I guess the uh, one I would suggest is kind of leaving it as is right now and focus on the on the the the, the direction we're moving in right now. Get those things flushed out, and then once we get those levels in and we have those discussions around how we're going to manage those, go back and just do a complete policy review line them up with the parameters that we set and target areas like this. There was, you know, what Sean mentioned about the, the, um, the state Limitation. requirements, state, you know, and, and then, you know, get those, so get those parameters in first and then flush through everything with an eye towards the working around those agreed parameters. Does that make sense? Because it's, it's rather than kind of, I'm just worried if we make an adjustment now, it might be counterintuitive to what we're asking to accomplish without really knowing what the impacts are. So we're at the same end. The near-term way to make some headway, it, it would, it's really in your capital budgeting policy. As all of you know well, there were a number of items that started in the operating that ultimately shifted over. And if we are able to remain true to funding you know, those predictable year-over-year -year, uh, repeating expenses like a plow truck and buses, um, and finding a way to fund those in operating and staying true to that, you're accomplishing the same task and you appreciate that through the trials and tribulations of the budget review and deliberation process, a lot of that stuff gets shifted over onto the capital side and we end up financing it. So the reservation I have or the question I have is that um, I, I'm okay leaving it the way it is. I, for some reason, I think there was a reference to 2012 because it says at the end that we have six years from the date of the adoption of the policy. And I think there was some type of reference to 2012. That's when it was, it was adopted in it was So adopted. we have until March of 18. So for now, the reason, yeah. so the reservation I have is that so we passed the capital budget and product product policy as well that set into place um, a change in practice that we weren't able to accomplish. So the question I have is which takes priority, this type of effort or the capital projects, because I think that we need, if we're going to put it in here, you need to start planning for it. It's cross the board with all policies that deal financially, because it's going to have a pretty significant impact on the presentation of the budget to the manager. So well. I'm just a little bit, sometimes when you <coughs> open something up, and, you know, it's, you know, it's like a wound. 
start scratching it, opening it up, it's going to irritate people. We'll leave it alone and let's deal with what we've already opened up and trying to treat. I'm a little bit more reserved in that area. I'd rather take personally, I'd rather take care of the capital policy, capital budget policy first and get that implemented rather than worrying on this. And extending this out a couple more years, but um, deal with that after we've been able to successfully manage the capital budget, which directly impacts. I think the purpose of the equipment reserve fund was to, in effect, start using that instead of bonding. But uh, right, right. Yeah. And it actually, let that fall through the cracks. So. A citizen recommended that as well as part of the budget conversation so on this past year. Mars yeah. So um, not knowing it was already in our policy. So. But and we could always do the depreciation, you know, because we look at all capital right. equipment. We could start with like this year's capital equipment yeah. that we bought. You know that we buy this year and just use that first year's depreciation, which would be I mean, that's, yeah. much smaller. That's a good, and that's kind of a good approach. You know, you, you're at least addressing it. You're starting. Um, the greater dependence is on the capital budgeting. This is a smaller piece, and then over time, you're eventually going to be able to put less emphasis on the capital budgeting and more emphasis on this policy. So, the only other thing, if I can, is um, you had mentioned excise. I know the state keeps trying to uh, pull that money Claw away that from that. the towns and. They, they like to use the excise for road maintenance, so if we're starting to use it for like equipment replacement, they might say, see, you don't want to use it for, yeah, right. so that would be my only plug concern. Plug trucks, and they'd be able to just yeah. yeah. I think you're being nice when you say that they're pulling it away. I think they're stealing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just, never mind. I'm <laughs> Concise, <laughs> brief. Yes. Do you guys have any, so I, I think for your suggestion was to kind of go back, we'll do some word snippet around the debt section, come back and, Revisit the next meeting. Anything else in here, or is everybody oh, very happy? Very nice. Good not morning. in there. I've got another matter. If you'll indulge me for five minutes. So, is that good? Nice job. Very nice. Very nice. And we'll get so, we'll get Tom. Tom needs a little more. Yeah. Well, um, I think some good news. Uh, we've got some things hot off the press, so I apologize. It wasn't even in our minds at the time the agenda was uh, minted in. Uh, we've just received some materials late this afternoon, so um, we're, we're starting to get some clarity around what our FY19 debt service might look like, and there's a number of really significant variables kind of in the air. Uh, obviously, public safety building, um, the amount of uh, CFP borrowing we might be uh, looking to bond. So the team here has been kind of crunching those numbers, working with our advisors. Uh, we were met with some good news uh, from Joe Putaro, who's our financial advisor, kind of on two fronts. Uh, Joe's in the middle of a lot of different bond deals uh, around the state. And first, what you'll see is a listing of really recent bond sales. Um, the point here and his message to us is that um, you'll look at the second to last column. That's the interest rates that all those deals closed at. What's really important about that is all the modeling we did for the public safety building was based on 3.5%. Wow, one point. Well, some of those were negotiated sales. Uh, South Portland's unique. Their kind of uh, their credit rating is like top. It's the best of the best. So, so throw that kind of out. That's an outlier. But I think with some degree of comfort, particularly in the near term, we're saying you know in the first quarter of uh, of 18, um, we could expect and would likely enjoy more favorable interest rates. And so. Uh, We've actually done some modeling around that, so you can appreciate what that would mean for us. Uh, what you'll see behind there is a couple of different amortization schedules. Uh, the first one, and look at the bottom uh, of the page, and it should say 19495 at the bottom in terms of the amount to be financed. You see that? Uh, yes, page E. Well, they all page E. So, oh, so you guys have pulled it over. So, Sorry. Uh, th that is to be compared to this other amortization schedule, the one that Larissa has put together, and this is the one that we've been using for all the public safety building presentations. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you'll see the debt service, bottom line savings, it's about $1.3 million in interest uh, savings by virtue of half percent. Uh, change in interest rate. Um, on top of that, we've done some um, detailed look at what are what's the likely um, amount of CFP borrowing we'll look at for next spring, 
and although it's been approved in the range of almost $6 million, uh, we expect much closer to three, three one, three two. Uh, the biggest reason is the Guam Road Phase 1 just isn't ready uh, and won't be coming forward. So uh, we can now with... Yeah, good news, bad news. We can now, with a much greater degree of certainty, kind of compare or put all these pieces together and get a much better sense of where our uh, FY19 debt service is likely to fall. And it looks like some, some nice savings. Uh, the final piece of good news that Joe delivered to us is that, uh, as he always does, he was scouring through our existing uh, um, debt and has identified uh, series 2010, 12, and 13 that are eligible for refunding. The aggregate amount of all those um, issues is just over $13 million. He's uh, identifying present value savings of uh, advanced refunding of about 560000 or cash flow savings of uh, about six fifty. dollars the way it works out. And what he's put together, and this is the first cut through, we haven't really had time as a full staff to understand it, but we asked him to do a number of things. Um, one is level out the savings over the existing term, kind of enjoy that benefit for the entirety. Um, reduce the term by five years, kind of shorten the time frame, so plow the savings into reducing the term. And the third option, uh, and this one might be attractive to us given some of our expected budget challenges, is front load the savings. And you'll notice the scenario three with the bubble dive by diagrams. Um, the Right-hand column shows potential savings in debt service front-loaded of $350,000 in FY19. These are choices that we can make in terms of how we want to take those savings. But we can't do number two. You're right, we can't because there's, uh, there's no, negative the savings. savings. Yeah. He was really responding to staff requests. Yeah. And how, how might we be able to uh, enjoy these uh, debt service savings. Um, I guess the caveat to this is would be a, a, an acceleration or moving up of our typical bonding rather than waiting till April, May. We'd do it in January, and that's really all based on the fact that uh, interest rates are going to move at some point, and the sooner we strike the market, the better. And so we're in a position that really puts a lot of pressure on Gina and and Ruth to finalize the audit. We'll be doing rating calls. In, Jan in December, excuse me. Um, so, I don't know about you, but um, when there's opportunity for debt service savings, I, I think what we'll see this year is a lot to wait on the public safety to see what happens there. Uh, but at the very least, we'll do CIP borrowing and advance refunding uh, in, in early in the new year, probably January, February. I guess the final piece that we're starting to talk about is how, assuming we get a positive approval from the voters, it's quite clear we don't need to borrow it all at once. In fact, there are really strict requirements from IRS and SEC. You must spend bond proceeds within 24 months of receiving them. And just given the timing of the project, it's not likely we're able to do that. So more than likely we would borrow probably $15 million. We'll, we'll still be spending on the majority of the money up front, and then another five or whatever remainder is in the following year. And that all of a sudden changes the equation for debt service. Mm -hmm. um, so, that rates, does that impact the rates at all? It shouldn't. Uh, 15 to 19, that shouldn't really, it's still a sizable issue, particularly when you add in 3 million in CIP and then an advanced fund refunding of 13 million. I think we're, we're a major player and we'll get a lot of attention. Um, so I guess the point of all of this, and a lot has been made, I think rightfully so, through the whole public safety building discussion about modeling what the future looks like. This is a great example of, as we start to get some clarity, um, the good news is everything is trending in the right direction, um, but it's very hard until you start to get that clarity to really do this accurately. And whether we can use an opportunity with some of this new information between now and November 7th, to help further inform that discussion and whether we can actually have that resonate and it, uh, out in the public. That's the conversation I think will continue on tomorrow. Uh, but it's good information. There's been a lot of, inter a lot of interest, so we're inclined to share it out and we'll see how it's consumed and received. Do you like the model? I do more than the model. Okay.
I'm still tempted to three fifty. Uh, well, uh, I was looking at front loading the savings in a year that we know we're going to. Depends need. on what you intend to do. So I like, from a long term perspective, I like number one because it's balanced. You, you, you save more money. I mean, you're saving an additional hundred thousand. I mean, that's a lot of money, hundred and twenty thousand. Um, and it's you know it's a balanced approach over time. Number two, though, that if we make a policy statement that we're going to use our savings to fund some of our other policies, such as the conversation we just had around depreciation and, you know, long term, then I like three because you're front loaded. And, and so if we make a commitment that that front load is going to go into that account, you're achieving two policies. Well, remember, we've got a hard landing we're yeah. looking at oh, no, uh, with, with fund balance, too. <laughs> so a way to soften yeah, I mean, that. My, my understanding is that there has to be a balance in the approach that we take. So if we're not going to have a commitment to fund that expenditure account that we just talked about or the uh, depreciation uh, for maintenance, um, then I like the balance approach because long term, if we save more money. If we don't need a decision tonight. Yeah. I just want you to know yeah, that, uh, yeah, I think it's good news and there's a number of ways we can um, move forward. We can bring it back to you and early December and make some of those decisions. Just, just, well, just, I'm sorry, didn't, didn't you say we needed, we needed something uh, you know, the first reading we authorized the 15th of the 15th? Is that, is that a timeline? Of the this is the proposed timeline that the uh, Joel Kutar put together for us. Yeah. Okay. I haven't looked at that. So, yeah, we're probably, at, in order to do this, we have to do a first reading, there's a second reading, and then there's a, a waiting period based on our town charter, I believe, uh -huh. that uh, so that citizens can come back and say, hey, you know, and then once that 20-day period is over, then then we can move forward and, and work on the yeah. rest of this. So, so we're so looking at January. Right. So, those so we'd have to make this decision fairly quickly, then I would think of which direction you want to move, right? Yeah. Well, I think the decision is whether you just want to do the advanced refunding, how you actually structure right. how it, that, that's detailed to be sorted through. I don't think that needs to be understood, certainly in first reading. Just a quick question. So the cash flow savings that you have here, the column two of the one point eight million, is that the net present value of the cash streams, or is that just the gross savings over time? I believe it's just the gross savings over time, but uh, it would be interesting to run a net present value of that because I mean the big chunk of that savings comes way out in two thousand and thirty-seven. So actually, scenario one or two might be better. We can't do. Can't do two. I mean, one or three oh. might be better from a present value point of view. Also, well, you've got present value on page on the second one here, right? Is that? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, oh, that's a different. That's a different scenario. Sorry. Well, present value is shown on that same page. Yeah, it's further up. Five sixty. Five forty-two and five sixty. Yeah. On page, yeah. He's got his present value right. here, but I don't know if that's. Is that what you're referring? To? No, sorry, on this page. Oh, right this page. Yeah, right here he's got PV savings. Okay. And we can certainly have. We could certainly have Joe come and sit, in, and uh, yeah. I don't profess to, to know all the differences between the cash flow savings and present value, but um, there's an opportunity that he's highly recommending yeah. we take. I guess just from a quick philosophical I mean, I tend to, I, I think I tend to lean more towards what Tom was saying, I mean, because I mean, our goal from the whole process is to kind of even out this budget swing, and right. if we do a, kind of a, I don't want to say a knee jerk reaction, but if we just respond to this thing as a one time thing, uh, I think that might not necessarily level things out, but it's, you know, we're, I'm going to say Robert and Peter to pay Paul because that's not fair to you, but you know what I'm saying. I, I, I'd rather have the balance approach. I think it's I think it's justifiable that we end up saving the town more money over the longer period. Um, and it's just, you know, I, I, we need to manage our expenses the way we manage our expenses. You know what I mean? Not justify it based on an influx of cash. So be mine. With that, because if you, if you look at the numbers, you, you know, uh, Ruth had mentioned uh, when they looked at the model for that depreciation expense account for you know future debt, um, you say it was like 1.4 million, mm -hmm. almost 600,000 just in the first two years. If you take option three, yeah. if that was the goal, sometimes it's worth. Well, I, I think a little bit are yeah. not saving as much in order to achieve other things. Right. That's why we have the discussion about it. I can go, I can go to it. Just my initial reaction would be, you know, I'll face it up. But we're up against the box. Yes, yes, we are. Okay. That's a good part. So with that, the only other thing is uh, for the public, next finance meeting meeting, if it works for everyone, is November 9th. And public comment, but I don't see anybody.
here that wants to make a public comment, but if anybody's free to. Peter, can I just, um, for anyone that's watching at home and is feeling frustrated that we've been discussing documents that they didn't have access to in the agenda packet, they really, they were provided to us, you know, 3.30 on this afternoon, um, but they're all available um, to be posted online tomorrow. We'll put them up. Thank you. Great work. Thank you, sir. Second.